I love that song. It's a great song. Do that, repeat that chorus, and you look at the cross up here, and you really think the impact of that song is really neat to see. In a couple weeks, we're gonna um, have our uh, <clears throat> kind of know, report back Sunday or State of the Church Sunday. Uh, we'll take a little time during our, our break and talk about kind of where we were in 2021, what we accomplished. We accomplished a lot. We see really God moving and working in the church and uh, talk about what we're going to do in 2022, some of the things that we're going to highlight and really push forward as a church as we continue to make our impact here, uh, not only in our community, which is a super important, but we try to reach out and impact our region with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we look forward to that in a couple weeks. Also, uh, we've got a baptism scheduled for that Sunday also. So I'm excited about that. If you if you haven't been baptized and you'd like to be baptized, let me know. We'd love to have you do it. We can do it any Sunday. Any Sunday you want to have a baptism, I'll set it up during the week and be excited to dunk anybody anytime they want to say that they love Jesus and they want the whole world to know. We're excited about that, but if you haven't done that, that's something you'd like to do, uh, uh, let me challenge you to, to think about that and let us know at that. So we see God moving and, and some good things happening, so we're super excited about that. We're in the book of Titus uh, as we continue to uh, uh, look at uh, the really a uh, letter to, to, from Paul to Titus, a young pastor who's out there uh, trying to get the, get the job done, and there's a lot of great guidance uh, in this uh, book. You think about, um, we watch here, if you're kind of redneck like me, you, you might watch NASCAR from time to time. Uh, in Europe, they watch uh, Formula One's big in Europe. I'm not so much of a fan of Formula One. You can't crash. I mean, you can't touch cars in Formula One. They crash. But in NASCAR, they can, you know, Rubbin's racing. That's the old saying. And, uh, but anyways, so the pit crews in NASCAR or Formula One are highly trained. They, the, the car races in there and the teams, they jump over and they can change four tires and put two, you know, put 20 or 30 or 40 gallons of gas in a car in what, 10, 12, 13, 14 seconds, right? And if you do, if the best team does it in 13 seconds and you do it in 14 seconds, you've, you've lost a quarter of a lap on the racetrack. It's huge, the amount just to, that much time goes by, your team's that much slower goes by. Well, there was a, a head of a hospital in England and he was watching a Formula One race and he decided that um, he was thinking about his ER unit. And he was thinking about, he, so he brought in the, the crew chief and some of the crew members from the Formula One team to train his ER people. And his, his whole point was, and you can imagine the doctors and the nurses are like, seriously, car dudes, gearheads are coming in here to show us how to do doctoring? And you can imagine the push on that. But it was a smart idea because really what he noticed in the ER that sometimes when they're in an emergency situation, when they had to unhook patients and get them to surgery or wherever they had to go next, it took up to a half hour because it was a very complicated process. And what NASCAR, these pit crews are, at, are really good at is making complex maneuvers, complex maneuvers, simple. And so they, uh, uh, they had that team train them and they made it much more efficient and made it life-saving. You think about seconds on a racetrack are a big deal. Sometimes seconds and minutes when you're dealing with somebody's life in an emergency situation could be, you know, uh, whether a good outcome, great outcome, or a terrible outcome. And it's interesting when we can look around and see that kind of perspective. And that's really, as, as leaders, the, our, our sermon this morning is titled Godly Leadership. Because leaders need, this, this leader of this, this hospital had vision. He understood that they needed to get better at different levels. And uh, leaders need vision. They need drive. They need to inspire those around them. But the most important quality is character. And uh, the, the character of a leader reflect, uh, reflected in the standard they set for themselves. A leader needs to exemplify the standards that he expects his team uh, to do. And that was uh, a Ray Kroc, who was uh, head of McDonald's, uh, said that. The quality of, of leaders is reflected in the standards they set for themselves. Let's look at our passage this morning. We're going to be in, in Titus. Uh, we're going to start at, at verse 5 and uh, uh, read to about 16. It says this, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might <clears throat> put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. 
If, anyone, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery, insubordination, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcised party. They must be silent since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in faith not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away, who turn things away from the truth, from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. To the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. This morning, godly leadership is vital to a healthy church. Godly leadership obviously is vital to a healthy church, but it's also vital to a healthy family. It's also vital to a healthy culture. This morning we're going to dive in. You're looking at this passage. You're like, well, that's talking about church leaders. What am I going to get out of that? I think it's important that we realize in this passage that we'll see a standard uh, that exemplifies godly, godly leadership. But this standard is a standard that we should have in our own lives as we walk uh, in our walk with Christ. These principles can be put in, involved into our own families, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But these, these leadership principles can, should be taught and, and learned and exemplified uh, in, our, in our families. There was a, a burglary a while back. Um, and down in South Carolina, and uh, some of the robbers do things a little bit different, but this guy just kicked in the door of a convenience store that was closed and, uh, and uh, did about $2,500 in damages between kicking in the door and kicking in the beer kick cooler door and got some beer and he got some cigarettes and he got some uh, various other items. Uh, a couple of things that he was carrying out, as he was carrying out, tried to carry as much as he could, he had two or three bags of Cheetos and on the way out of the broken door, he snagged the Cheeto, the couple Cheeto bags had a couple holes in them. And the police were able to follow his trail of Cheetos about a half a dozen doors down. There was a house where he stopped and unlocked his door that was locked and there was a pile of Cheetos and they apprehended him very, very quickly. It's, inter <laughs> it's interesting, uh, you know, a buddy of mine said, sin makes you stupid, right? And uh, we see that exemplified there. But you think of the inner, inward motivations uh, of a leader. When you think about that robber and his inward motivations, just like, I need beer and I need whatever, and I'm just going to go get it. Right? And he does the wrong thing. Inward motivations really drive us as, as, as people. And we have to be careful, those who want those to be godly. Look at verses... Uh, six through eight. If anyone is above reproach, husband and one wife, and his children are believers, are not to be open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. But a hospitable, lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. A lot of these characters are, are inward motivations. Uh, the first one is it should be a family man. Uh, uh, that's important. Uh, one loyal family man, a husband, uh, uh, one wife, it mentions here, and that's the that's, uh, idea of, of loyalty and the connection. And also, also it says to be above reproach. It's interesting because it's, it's really talking about a good reputation. Uh, so often we, we talk about, whether here from the pulpit or we, we kind of know, if you think back in your, your, if you've attended church for years, I have, grew up in a church, that there's certain Certain people wandered in, they, they, they live their lives like crazy town outside of church, but when they get in church on Sunday, they act like they're just, you know, they're just as godly as all get out. Uh, I knew of a businessman that was like that. During the week, he would 
lie, cheat, and steal to do whatever he could to get his business to grow. But when he came in on Sunday, he looked perfectly normal and acted like he was uh, a strong believer. Having a good reputation is important. I think about uh, Timothy. Uh, he's a young pastor. If you look at across the page, uh, Book of Timothy, First and Second Timothy, written to him. Uh, he's mentioned in Book of Acts, and let me read that real quickly. Uh, you don't have to turn there. Book of Acts, uh, chapter sixteen, verses one and two. Paul came to uh, Derby and to uh, Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra in Iconium. And that's the key. That's a good reputation. He was well spoken of um, by those in those two cities. What's your reputation? What is your reputation out in town here? And people talk about you. What do they say? That's really what we're driving home. Do you have a good reputation? Do you have one that's, uh, um, that's uh, something that would would honor the Lord. Notice that along with that good reputation being above reproach, there's a couple other categories that we can throw in here. One would be uh, we're to control our anger. Uh, James talks about anger. Uh, how you got to control your anger. That's important that we have a, a, somebody that can control their anger. The other thing that's mentioned too is they shouldn't be a, a drunkard. Uh, shouldn't be a, a drunkard. So above reproach is kind of wrapping a few categories into it. And I think that's a common sense. In our leaders, we want to see a sense of honor. We want to see a sense of uh, having a good reputation, somebody that's not going to fly off the handle every time they get irritated with somebody. We also see the idea of not being arrogant, uh, not being proud, to make sure that other needs are met ahead of their own. It's an important, important thing. Thinks of others first. Another huge key for our leaders are to be hospitable. That uh, they're to be lovers of strangers. We, do, we talk about that as a, as a church body. You know, when, when new people come into the church, do we welcome them? Do we embrace them? We do a pretty good job here, I'm going to be honest with you. But there's always times when we go say hi to our friends and we've got newer people that we don't embrace. But it's kind of a bigger thing. How are we to our community when we're out in our community? Are we hospitable? to those out in our community. A good leader would do that. He's a lover of strangers. He, he's, he's genuinely concerned. And I'd like to mention uh, a Gerald Nelson at this point. He's got a reputation, a good reputation, a, a one that's hospitable. His sugar shack was a place that you come and hung out. I wish I would have known about the sugar shack. Just the name sounds pretty cool. But he mentioned uh, uh, that uh, going in, talked to his wife, mentioned that uh, he uh, he didn't like days when nobody would stop in and say hi to him. That's a hospitable. That's that's emulating this category right here. See, it's the ability to interact with many different people. The interaction causes an understanding of people's situations. When we understand what's going on in our community out here, we're more apt. And we're better able as a church to be reflective or be reactive to the needs in our community. Certain communities have different needs. And, and we need to be reactive to those and, and be a part of that. And it, it helps make people feel comfortable. If you've got, you're inviting someone to church, but you don't have a personal relationship with them, what are the odds of them coming to church? The whole idea of being hospitable is investing in people and then saying, hey, I really enjoy going to Goodland Community Church. The pastor's boring at times, but uh, we'll get over that, but the rest of it's pretty darn cool, right? So whatever tagline you're gonna use, but it's that relationship that draws people to, a, to their walk with Christ. They see you exemplify Christ in their lives, but it's you and the building that relationship that draws people to, whether well, it's our church building or to that relationship, which is ultimately important. I think the fourth or fifth thing that we see that's important, self-controlled. That's huge for all of us, the idea of discipline. My boys, all my boys played sports. Now, Ray back there, he's a, he's a Russell, Russell coach, aren't you, Ray? And uh, he's trying to hide. And uh, he coaches wrestling. And what's cool about 
Coaches is they teach young people, he invests in young people, coaches invest in young people to learn self-discipline. My boys learn that when you go to play sports, if you're gonna be good at it or even adequate at it, you have to be disciplined, you have to be self-controlled, you have to put the time into practice, you have to put the time into exercise. You have to get up early and go to school, before school sometimes and lift weights, or you have to leave after school and lift weights before practice. You have to do the extra things. And we, we see that and that's important. The discipline uh, to start and see the completions, goals, and projects. We don't want leaders that, that start projects and then wander off. We want to see them push them through no matter how hard it is. That self-discipline allows us to, to attain goals that we normally wouldn't be able to attain because we're so focused on getting to the goals and we don't worry about the things that get in our way. That self-discipline helps us get to the goals. So if our goal for uh, is to walk with Christ and we're trying to put these things in our lives and self-discipline is the key to really making all these things come together and helping us move forward. But we should see that in our leaders. See, the idea is that somebody self-controlled uh, is uh, restrained and not controlled by their emotions. You know, people that are controlled by their emotions, they go whichever way it goes. And there's several passages in the Bible that challenge us not to be swayed by our emotions, that, that we need to be self-disciplined and stay true to what is true. See, this biblical, biblical motivations are the key to successful leadership. Biblical qualities that prepare the heart for our outward expressions. See, when we practice these qualities that, we, that are just mentioned, we put them as a part of our lives and we try to do them the best we can, and we're not going to be perfect. Don't misunderstand and I'm up here like, you know, we all walk in a, in a perfect way. We all make our own mistakes and have our own weaknesses. What we're trying to improve is the process here. When we do that, those inward things that we're working on become outward expressions. I've got a video I want to show you. You have to listen to the dialogue. It's a commercial. It's just a commercial I came across the last couple of weeks. It's not hilarious, but it's cute. It's between a husband and wife. They go to a baby gender reveal party. They're coming home. Listen to the back and forth. I think you'll get a kick out of it. Oh man, my laces are ruined. The gender reveal was more fun than I thought. Get in the back. Look, your cousin dared me. I had no choice. My cousin is 12. <laughs> this is your captain speaking. You know, because they're like captain's chair. To be fair, I did say heads up. To be fair, you're sleeping on the couch. Hey, Mercedes, change lighting to baby blue. I think you're actually more annoying back there. Get up here. The Mercedes-Benz GLS. Perfect bliss wherever you sit. I'm going to grab the handle now. I love that. That's a great interplay between a husband and wife, right? That's kind of how it goes. We all can relate to that. But a baby uh, gender reveals, reveals seem to be a big thing in the last few years uh, and it's just gotten kind of out of hand with all some of the spectacular stunts that they've been pulling. But why? It's an outward expression of the excitement that they have for this new child that's coming. They want everybody to know that this child is important in their lives. Those, those inward things that they've been working on as a family have now they get they want everybody to know that hey we've got a kid coming it's gonna be a boy or a girl and it's gonna be a great great celebration. I, I look at this outward ex expression is so important. We can say we have these inward crates, but are they showing up on the outside? And that's the key. Look at verse 9. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and be able to rebuke, rebuke those who contradict it. He needs to know, leaders need to know sound doctrine. He needs to be in God's word regularly. You expect me to be in God's word regularly. You don't expect me just to show up and just kind of open the Bible to a random passage and start yakking, right? You expect me as a leader to be in there because this is the role I have. The same as believers, we need to be in God's word. This outward expression needs to happen. We, be, we need to be able to defend the core beliefs of our faith. In some ways, that's, that's my job as a pastor, but it's also yours as individuals. You're getting challenged if you talk with your friends that may, go to, uh, may not go to church. They don't understand why God's standard says certain things. And it might be confusing to them, and they say it doesn't relate to me, but it does relate to them. And if we know that and can express it to them, then it helps them start their walk with God. And it's important that we know that. 
we know that sound doctrine because we need to teach sound doctrine. We need to teach sound doctrine. Marlene, back there, Dallas fan, back there. They, they teach our kids, right? When the kids are here, they teach them. That's important, that's a huge deal that they teach and invest in the kids so that they know that they're responsible to help communicate God's truth to people. That's our role as believers and our church leadership should do the same thing. They need to be involved in ministry, suited to their gifts. We talk about our spiritual gifts and our talents and abilities that God's given us and we should use those uh, to uh, continue uh, for people to know God's word. As a believer here at Goodland Community Church, we would like you involved in our ministry, whatever that means for you. We've got different areas for each of you, depending on your gifts. Not everybody has to be up here talking in front. Not everybody needs to lead a Bible study. Not everybody should be up here singing, myself included, right? But we have certain ones in certain areas that you can get involved in. We'd love to have you involved in those, uh, those areas. A leader needs to be a shepherd. Good leaders need to be shepherds. That's uh, guards and protects. Look in Acts uh, chapter 20. Uh, I'm going to turn there briefly. Acts chapter uh, 20. Uh, let's see here. There it is. Verse 17. And then we're going to jump down to 28. Now, uh, Middle East. Uh, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders to the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them. So the church leaders call and the church leaders come in and he says this to them. It goes on a big discussion, but I want to just grab a couple of verses here to talk about. Look at verse 28. It says this, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Pay careful attention to yourselves to make sure that we're on track and to all the flock to which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he ordained in his blood. So as church leaders, if you're on the board or you're in a pastoral role like I am, we're to be shepherds. As individual Christians, we can do the same type of, uh, have the same type of tr track. We're to keep watch over the flock. The, the idea here is we don't have any personal agendas. Notice who the church is. Made your overseers a care for the church of God. It's Christ's church. This isn't our church. This isn't Pastor Ken's church. It's not your church. This is Jesus Christ's church. And we're to understand his vision and act his vision. And that's what we're trying to do. And we're to care for it and pay special attention to it. And so many of you guys do. And we're so appreciative of all the work that you do around here. There's a, there's a lot of examples out there of, of living out uh, godly principles. We should be able to see that in our lives, that we live those uh, things out in our lives. There was a dad uh, in Texas. He won't give his name. And when you hear the story, I think you'll know why. He was on a family vacation. Um, family vacation, they had a, a motor home. And he was driving through the night, and uh, uh, he went to pump gas. And the plan was for him to drive halfway through the night, and when they pumped gas, they would change drivers. Uh, his wife would start driving, and uh, the rest of the family, he's got a family of five. And so he pumped gas, finished pumping gas, went in to go to the bathroom. When he comes out, motorhome's gone. Family took off without him. Problem was, the cell phone's in the motorhome with, on the charger. His family assumed he'd already got in the, in the thing, crawled back into bed. Nobody wanted to disturb him, so the rest of them were sleeping, so the wife just took off. No cell phone. They called the police. The police couldn't figure out how to get a hold of him because it was going down. It took several hours. He ran over to a local motel, got on Facebook on a, on a computer, and was able to track down one of his kids and get him to turn around. They made it 100 miles before they realized, and still didn't really realize until... He called five different cell phones, nobody's answering, over and over. Um, he was a little uh, embarrassed, uh, nonetheless, to think about that, uh, uh, that story. I think uh, we think about family life uh, in our passage this morning, because it does kind of touch upon uh, having godly leadership in our individual families is important. I'm going to turn to Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to hit a couple of verses here. 
as we go because I want to take the principles that we just talked about and infuse them into our family walk because remember at the beginning we talked about that these are principles for a healthy church these are principles for a healthy family and when we have healthy families all over this community we're going to have a healthy community Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her Husbands, we're to be the spiritual leaders of our house. We are commanded to lead our houses. We are responsible for the spiritual uh, well-being that our kids, as they grow up, are being taught properly and are in church and whatever uh, principles that you want to teach them, hard work and all that, all those good things. Those, that is, God expects us to be a spiritual leader. We want those traits that we just covered should be exemplified as husbands. We should exemplify those. But notice the passage here. It says, husbands, love your wife. We're to love and encourage our wives. We're to love our wives as Christ loved us. So I want ladies and husbands, I want husbands to think about today, are you loving your life, wife like Christ loved you? He's willing to sacrifice for himself. So most husbands are willing to sacrifice for, ultimately for our wives. But this is the whole, the whole concept is that we're starting at that, that we just love them more than we love ourselves. And that's the command to us. We're to encourage our children. Notice Ephesians 6, uh, verse 4. says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We're to teach our families. A lot of you guys uh, may have grandchildren. You still carry that responsibility you know, to, to invest in help Help your kids raise their kids uh, without being crazy. Don't be crazy grandparents, right? But uh, when you get the opportunity, invest in them and instruct in them. And that's a, that's a huge thing that can go on. So as husbands, we have leadership roles. We are to love our wives. If we love our wives better than we love ourselves, then they will, they will uh, love us back. And that's the beauty of the system. And notice here, and this is, this is really a, um, this passage, gets uh, certain people in trouble. I'm going to read it anyways. Uh, go up to Ephesians 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. His body is himself its Savior. Now the church submits to Christ so that the wives should submit everything, uh, submit in everything to their husbands. In our day and age, the, this term submit seems harsh. This idea um, Debbie's not here. She's spending time with her oldest uh, up in Midland today, this weekend. Um, but uh, she would say, uh, you know, she's always got some jokes about submitting, right? We all, we all do. That commercial we had earlier, I love that interplay between the husband and wife back there. This whole concept of submitting is misunderstood. Husbands, I want you to listen carefully. As ladies, I want you to listen to this concept. Because God wrote this book and we say that his word is authoritative, right? So we can't just pick and choose what we don't like. And he put the word submit in here. So let's understand what that means because we miss, in today's day and age, we misunderstand what this means. This idea of uh, is word to submit like Jesus. I, I came across this example. Andy Stanley is a pastor uh, of a large church. Uh, his dad was a pastor, Charles Stanley. I think still is. Both of them are. Uh, do a pretty good job, both of them. But he was, uh, uh, when he was younger, he was attending a wedding. Uh, and there was a bunch of 20-somethings there. And uh, one of the bridesmaids came to him and said, hey, you're a pastor. I know you're a pastor. And, and the Bible says this. And here's what, here's what the question she said. Andy, I heard a preacher say that the man had to be the head of the home because a two-headed home is like a two-headed monster. Is that what you believe, that the man is the head? And here's a gist of kind of what he said. Uh, he kind of wrote it down, and I'm quoting him. Think about this. Before I answer your question, imagine you're married to a man who genuinely believes you are the most fantastic person on the planet. So as I go through this list, gentlemen, this is our code. He's crazy about you. You have no doubt that your happiness is his top priority. He listens to you talk. He honors you in public. To use an old-fashioned term, he cherishes you. He's not afraid to make a decision. He values your opinion. He leads, but he listens. He's responsible. He's not argumentative. 
You have no doubt that he would give his life for you if the need arose. You never worry about him being unfaithful. In fact, to quote an old Flamingo song, he only has eyes for you. And he says, when I finished, I paused and asked, would either of you have trouble following a man like that? The girl to my right blurted out, well, heck no, I want to meet that guy. See, this idea of submitting is, is, is not losing any value. Think about Christ. Jesus Christ submitted to the Father. But do we look at Christ and go, well, he's less God than God the Father? We're not understanding Trinity properly if we think God the Father is more important than Jesus. They're equals in every way. Look at, uh, uh, I'm going to turn to John chapter 8 briefly. If you look at uh, John chapter 8, Jesus is talking about this concept, uh, verses 16 through 18. Jesus says, uh, Yet even if I do not, uh, I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. He's calling himself, he's equal with God the Father. He's saying, when I judge, I'm judging as God the Father. I, we're, we're equal. Notice there's another passage here, just a, a few pages over in John 15. Verse 10 says this. Jesus is talking about being the true vine. He says this. If you keep my commands, I, I will abide. Uh, you, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So Jesus is saying, I'm following God's commands. God told me to do something and I'm doing it. Does that make Christ less important? Less valuable? See, when we understand this properly, Christ gave us the, the perfect example, ladies. Amen. We're to cherish our wives. We're to make sure that they're the most important thing and they know it. And the, and the counter is that, that, that marriage is really, really designed about equals forming to be a great team. This is about being two equals forming to be a great team. There's got to be some push and pull and some decisions have to be made at times, but it should be a collaborative effort. The Bible's not teaching anything different. Working together for a common cause, a godly home. Husband and wife, you're working together to make that a godly home that the next generation understands and has a relationship with Jesus Christ. That next generation is pulling our faith and working towards the kingdom to keep growing. Because when our families are healthy, our community's healthy. We're ladies, wives, we're to encourage your husband. Men, we're simple, let's be honest. We're not that complicated. When you ladies tell us we're awesome and like, hey, would you go do that for me? We're like, yeah, I'll go do it. See, it's all about approach, right? And that's the whole thing here. Husbands, we're to love the wives. Wives, to work and encourage your husband to work together, both of you to work together to bring a godly home. That's showing the inward traits in an outward way. Those principles we learned earlier about church leadership apply directly to each of our households this morning. See, godly leadership in the home uh, teaches uh, biblical truth. And this comes from both parents. Both parents should be illustrating and teaching biblical truths. Uh, we need to be an example of living it in real life. Your kids know what goes on in your household, and you should live that out in real life. We should be uh, explaining. We should be an example. We should be an explanation. We should be illuminating biblical truth and making it usable for the family. So as we're an example in a real life, we're explaining why we do the things that we do. Why do you work hard? Because it's good for you. You know, you, know, you go through the higher, you don't just you know, go do your chores and never explain why. Because hard work, self-control, self-discipline results in good things. So we're an example, we explain, and when we equip our children, we equipped our grandchildren to be in the world. We want to be in the world, but not of the world. That's why we're equipping uh, these youngsters so that they can, when they look and see what the world's trying to tempt them into something that, that God says is going to be harmful for them, they have enough sense to hopefully make the right decision. Now let me give you a little caveat for some of us families that have older children. Maybe adult children, as all mine are, my youngest is 20. So 
you raise them up and then when I get it 16, 17, 18 years old, you've invested everything that you can in them, but at that point they start making their decisions. And their decisions aren't always what we would want for them and their decisions aren't always godly. They're not, but think about it, when you were growing up, did you ever do everything your parents said exactly the way you wanted? Right, they wanted, no, yeah, I know Christy, that's what I'm saying, none of us do, right? My point is, trust that investment that you put in when they're younger, because it will come back and cycle around when they have kids. It will come back. It doesn't mean you keep, you don't, you keep praying for them, you keep trying to draw them back into, whether it's going to church or starting that, continuing that relationship or remember where the roots are from. But we can't decide what our adult children are gonna do. So don't carry that burden. But if you bring them up as an example, as an explanation, equipping your children, See, this protects the family from the moral decay of this world, and that's really what we're trying to do. See, godly leadership is a key to beginning a process that helps the church, uh, helps families, and ultimately helps our society. Our society is broken, it's hurting. A nuclear family is being attacked, being pulled apart. The roles are being changed. There's really no roles, just everybody can do whatever they want. That's not true. Kids aren't equal with parents. <laughs> they don't get that equalness. This world is trying to change everything, try to change all the roles. Because God said, look, these are the roles I'm putting in place, and when they're put into place, the harmony, we're, we're designed to be compatible for each other, compatibility. And when that happens in our family life, it just makes a huge blessing. And when you have to carry on the hard part of life, the hard times, the family can help carry you through. That's our challenge this morning as we look at God's Word, at Titus, this, this godly leadership. These, these principles are great for our personal life. They're great for our family life. Uh, it's a big challenge this morning. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we look to you and, and the sacrifice your Son, Jesus Christ, made on the cross, and we realize that, that starting that relationship changes us. And the standard for how we are to live our life has changed. And that we are to emulate godliness. That we are to be Christ-like in our actions. Help us work on this week, work on those inner things that are challenging us, that we've struggled with. Help those inner things that we're working on start to become outward motivations, outward actions, things that people notice. Help us to be bold and brave and talk about you whenever we can. As you continue to bless our time here, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.